you today, especially attending a baptism of a little baby. Children are the promise of the future. So that gives us hope that the next generation built and established in Christian faith. And uh, many times we see that the young people are not very much interested in church, that the traditional style of worshiping God on Sundays is kind of going away. But I am very glad to be here to talk about God's grace and faithfulness in our lives, even in the midst of all of these changing situations. Let me read the words from the book of Samuel, the Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 7, 12. The Samuel took a stone, and he set it up between Mizpah and Shem, and he, re he named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. A group of young people were driving on a highway and uh, they took an adventurous journey and the police officer stopped them and uh, told, them the told the driver that uh, they were going too fast. The maximum speed limit is 55 while they were going at 85. Then the young driver showed the officer the sign at the top and said, the sign says 85. The officer said, young man, that is the highway number and not the speed limit. Then the friends in the back seat gasped in shock and said, Thank you, officer, because we just got off I-285. <laughs> highway markers and exit numbers are very important. We all know that. And we need to know what that they mean. And uh, some people pay attention to those only, those speed limits only when they see a police car. I'm not saying anybody here. There are mile markers on every highway, every single mile. Now they try to match it up with exit numbers, so we only pay close attention to the exit numbers in many highways. It gives us a lot of help in our journey, in our travel. It tells us where we are at some point. It also tells us what direction we are heading to. And also it tells us how long we have traveled and how long we have to travel to get to our next destination. So these are all mile markers that we use knowingly or unknowingly in our travel on a regular basis. They can help you tell us exactly where you are. For example, if you are in an emergency and you got shut down in your car, you call police most of the time and you have to tell them some location. You cannot just tell them that we are next to a, uh, a big oak tree or something. It's not going to help you. But if you, you can tell them a location where you are an exit number on this highway or a mile marker at this highway, they can probably get to you faster and more effectively get you the help. And knowingly also, they give us a sense of comfort and peace, knowing where we are and what direction we are heading. If you don't know where you are, I don't think you will be settled. Ebenezer, as we read, was one of the mile markers in Samuel's life. And also the people of God had that mile marker because they were threatened by the enemy from around them and they were going to sub be subdued by the Philistines and they prayed to God and then God delivered them miraculously and you can read and then Samuel placed a stone as a marker as a remembrance and a reminder for them to remember the faithfulness of God and how they got how they were delivered by God in a very difficult situation in their life. So we all have Ebenezer's in our life, if we look back. These are my markers that we look back and remember how God kept us through on each of these things. I'm sure every one of you have my markers. In the Bible, there's a lot of my markers that we see, like the, the creation days, the, the six days of creation. Then we see the flood of Noah. Then we have the crossing of the Red Sea and also the crossing of the Jordan. These are main, main, very, very highly visible high, mile markers, even though there are numerous of them, one of them. And in the New Testament, the birth of our Savior Lord Jesus Christ and uh, his uh, baptism, his ministry, his crucifixion, his death and resurrection and ascension. These are all mile markers in New Testament in the scripture that we see and uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit and the establishment of the church and so many others. Uh, special times in our lives also, like I said. Our birth in this world is uh, one of the 
important mile markers. The first day of school, then becomes sweet 16 and legal uh, 21 or 18, I don't know what that is. And then we get to 30s and 40s and we celebrate our birthplace. These are all mile markers. Then it gets to 50s and 60s and nobody cares after that, really. Uh, but in, when you get to the 90s, you start counting again. It becomes very important at that time because we know the time is getting limited. Have mile markers like uh, our, our marriages, our first child, uh, our first job, first home, and promotion, or you know, moving from one place to the other, and then comes retirement, maybe like, and then uh, social security, then old age. Uh, these are all important mile markers in our lives, and some of them, like, very some of sad mile markers are also there. They're not always good sicknesses, death. When we look back on all these mile markers, we see one common thing as people of God, that God's faithfulness was there in every single one of these mile markers. And uh, it is good to have a reflection at some time in our life, once in a while. We'll take a look at our back, to back our life and see these mile markers. And this is one of those times that I usually remind people to take a look. It is one of those times. I do that on birthdays as well, but baptism is very special, mile marker uh, in our Christian journey. And this is um, a mile marker for Johann. Where do you see? He, he's out. <laughs> okay, Johann was born um, in April, right? In April of 2018. His birth was the first mile marker for him. He was born into this world April, is it 28? 2029, yeah, I was close. So, uh, and, and he opened his eyes to a group of stranger, strangers. He didn't know this world. He, didn't, he hasn't seen it yet. He hasn't seen his dad's face or mom's face or uh, his uh, grandparents' face. He, it's a strange world he was born into. That was the first mile marker in his life. And then we'll celebrate his uh, first birthday pretty soon. And that's another mile marker. He was probably afraid, and I'm sure he did, did cry. If he, if he, you know, if the baby doesn't cry, the doctors and nurses make them cry. To the people who were actually waiting for Johan to be born, he was not a stranger. No, because you were anxiously waiting for him to be born. And to be taken to your family as a member, I'm sure you decorated the room and had a big welcome, probably a cake or something, and had a big welcome party to welcome him to him as a part of your family. So that is how the parents and the dear ones in this world welcome that little child, and we all know that. And this baptism is exactly what that we are doing here today. We are welcoming Johan to the church family, the family of God. He is going to be uh, joined together with a big, big family of generations and generations of people who have taken this, uh, this baptism. And because through these baptisms, are all we connected as Christians, regardless of what denomination you are, or what creed or color or, or where you're from, as Christians, there's one connecting link, is that baptism. And that is what, what baptism water does. We are all our equalizers before this one sacrament. There are two sacraments that um, all Christian churches do and administer. One is the baptism, other is the Holy Communion. And there, these are two sacraments that are not are negotiable. Everybody, regardless of Catholic, Protestant, or that. The rest of them are ordinances that we call if you good. These two uh, sacraments, baptism and Holy Communion, are two sacraments that are common underlying sacraments that all denominations who call them Christians uh, perform and celebrate and administer. Both uh, baptism and Holy Communion are witnessing to the means of the grace of God. To be exact, baptism and Holy Communion are acts of God rather than act of man. I wanted to stress that very importantly. This is not an act of man. These two this is where we accept the grace of God that God performs and God already has given to us as gift. We accept it. Since many people may have differences of opinions about it, how the baptism is performed or when it is to be performed. 
For all Christians everywhere agree in ha having to be baptized by water and the Spirit. It is not an act of man. Today, Johan has joined a larger spiritual family called the Church. He will be joined through baptism. In the book of uh, the letter to Titus, Paul says like this, God saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done, but according to his uh, mercy by the baptism of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. In Malayalam, we read it, Punar Janana Snanam and Parishutat Mahavinda Navigar. It is an act of God that we receive and accept. That's all our part in it is, to receive what God has already offered to us through this. So it is a foremost uh, important activity that God performs to children who accept it. I commend Jijo and Shai that they made this decision to have this little child baptized in a young age at this time. And um, some people might think that they will wait till the child grows up and make a decision, but, uh, makes a decision for himself or herself. But to me, I, different, I look at it differently. We don't do that when it comes to sending our kids to school or when taking them to a doctor or getting them vaccinations or anything. We don't do that for them to make that decision. As parents, we have the responsibility to bring them to the family of God. And we have, because even if they don't know, it is our responsibility given to us because it's a gift that is given to you as parents. We should not wait for our children to decide about being in the family of God. Just as we don't wait for them to make a decision to be part of your family, right? So the earlier we can do it, the better we are. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come to me. Faith is not, it is not a product of reason. We all know that. Faith is faith, and it is more of a relationship than reason, and uh, it is about love and trust. And believe me, children know love and trust more than adults. So if we are baptizing him in the faith, Christian faith, it is he who accepts that because of his trust and love. When Jesus commanded his, commanded his disciples to let the children come to him, do not stop them. He was calling the disciples to do more than just to step aside and watch if they are going to go to Jesus. It is more than that. He was telling the disciples to actually bring them to him. In other words, there is an action that Jesus wanted them to do. He is calling all of us to work to help the children come to Christ. That responsibility falls on the shoulders of the parents as well as every disciple of Jesus Christ. That is why we are all today as a church. It is not just the parents. And also baptism declares the identity of, of this child as a child of God. That the child is not born of this world. The child is born of God. The Holy Spirit descended on Jesus at his baptism. You, I don't want to go into the details of that, but you all know that. When John the Baptizer uh, baptized, baptized Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit descended from heaven. Then there was a voice that came from heaven, and, and uh, it said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In the Gospels, there's a little difference if you look at it. In the Gospel of Mark and Luke, it is uh, given us the first uh, subject, like, you are my beloved son, that the voice is talking to Jesus himself. But in the Gospel of Matthew, there's a little difference there, it says, this is my beloved son, as if the voice was talking to the crowd. But to me, when I look at it, I see that as addressed to Jesus, as God's affirmation and a declaration to the people that witnessed it. You are my son. Let the world hear, this is my son. That is what is happening through baptism. Through this baptism, this little baby, God is talking to him directly and say, Johan, you are my son. I am well pleased with you. And you church are the witnesses to this sacrament that we are performing to 
bring him as family of God. And it's a privilege to be part of this uh, family to baptize Johan when we together claim and declare to the world that it is a child of God. Here today and now in the witness of, the, of this church and the presence of the triune God, we claim Johan to be part of God's family. And he is not for this world, but he is going to be for God. Trust, and we also trust this baby into the mighty hands of God today that no evil will touch him or will take him away from God's presence ever. And there is only one baptism. Just like we have only one father, we have only one spirit, and we have only one baptism. You don't have to be baptized again. Jesus received uh, the baptism not for his remission of sins, because Jesus was sinless, right? He didn't need baptism for remission of sin. But he took that baptism to identify with us, being a human being, in the form of a human being, to, to witness to the sacrament of baptism, to identify with each one of us. He didn't need to be baptized. So you don't need to be baptized again. It doesn't matter how long or how you are baptized, by sprinkling or by pasting, uh, I don't know, putting in a shower or immersing. It doesn't matter. This is a witness that we are doing to claim him as the child of God. And regardless of what, what you believe or what you don't believe, it doesn't matter in front of God how you do it or how long you immerse them in water either. You know, the more you are underwater, the more cleansing you get. I don't think so. Or if you are a sinner, you have to be pressed under water. Please don't keep them too much under water. And I know um, a friend of old friend of mine who actually went and baptized, rebaptized, because he found out that the minister who baptized him was later got arrested and sent to prison for some crime. So he thought that baptism was not good anymore. This minister doesn't have anything to do with it. He's just an instrument of God. He's just like a human being like you and me. We are all sinful in front of God. But this is an act of God and not an act of man. And it is all of our responsibility and include him too. We are, we are all here to witness this in front of God. Um, and also, I wanted to remind you that it is not a ticket to heaven. Don't be misunderstood. We just don't want to get it done because we want him to be safe. And then that's it. That's not it. It is an act of God that God has, is going to perform and telling him to claim him as God's son. We should feel a sense of urgency to reach out to those who have never been baptized. That is our commission and our mission today. To the church and the people of faith who are assembled here today, I want you to reflect on your baptism. If you, know, if you, if you remember it not, uh, or not, there is a covenant that was made during our baptism. And um, it tells us that we have a new life in Jesus Christ. And uh, we have to remind ourselves to repent of our sins regularly. Renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness and reject the evil powers of this world. That's a constant reminder of our baptism. Through baptism, we are buried with Christ and then risen again to life with Christ. Today we are all taking on a new responsibility by witnessing here. You cannot just walk away from here as the people who have come here because after attending this, this uh, baptism sacrament, you are taking, all of, each one of you, is taking a new responsibility. A responsibility that you are affirming in front of this church that you will care for this child, you will pray for this child, and you will do everything possible to bring him in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is the witness. It's a very important witness when you attend baptism. Believe me, if you don't like it, don't go there. Like the exit doors in the airplane, they will tell you, you will get more space here to sit, but remember, they will ask you some questions and say, if you are not able to perform these things, you are not going to be seated there. The baptism is very important. If you are going to witness it, that's an important responsibility that we are all taking up. Today we are taking on that responsibility to affirm. We will keep him in our prayers and do everything possible to increase him in faith, confirm his hope, 
and raise him in the knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ our Lord. I want to close with a little story that um, Ravi, Ravi Zacharias uh, in his book The Grand Weaver, I don't know, many of you have probably read that. In 2006, April of 2006, uh, Taylor University in Indiana, uh, students and staff members were coming back from a trip in a college van. Probably have remember slight remembrance of this incident, many of you. A truck hit them head on. Four students and one staff member died instantly. Funerals were held and the people mourned their losses. There was one girl who survived, only one survivor. Her name was Laura Van Ren. She was very seriously injured and disfigured. And she was in a coma for a few days. The Van Ren family rushed to the hospital and the entire family kept watch over her day and night. As the days went by, Laura started to recover. She opened her eyes and gradually began to speak. The family, they leaped to the joy in their hearts. And um, at every little progress, they were joyful. But some doubts began to come up uh, because of some of her responses that she was doing. She was, she was doing. They reassured themselves that this might be due to the head injuries that she got and it would take longer for her to get her memory back. But the strange, things that, strange thing is that as she was improving more and more, then they called her name, she would shake her and say, No, I am not Laura, I am Whitney. Oddly enough, there was a Whitney in the van, but she was killed and her family buried her. Nothing made sense. Why would she insist on being Whitney and not Laura? But when the dental records were studied, officials uncovered a huge mistake. Someone at the scene falsely identified the lone survivor as Laura. In fact, she was really Whitney. Laura was dead. The young woman recovering was not Laura, but if she was Whitney Clark. The rehab center notified the family about the mistake. Authorities exhumed the body of the girl mistakenly identified as Whitney and quickly determined by DNA testing that the body was that of Laura. Can you imagine the trauma and the shifting of emotions among the families? A family thought that their daughter was dead, found out that she was actually alive. While a family that is rejoiced in the survival of their daughter discovered that she had died in an odd way. Whitney will have the privilege of hearing and seeing her own funeral on YouTube and what others said about her during that funeral. Apologies and explanations from authorities came from far and wide and the coroner, out of embarrassment, resigned. Why would this all traumatize us? Why would it? It is because our identity is very important. Each of us is unique in front of God. Each of our lives is very valuable and precious for God. And that is what we are witnessing today. Johan is a precious creation of God. A gift to this world. Not just for you. And we love him. And we welcome him into God's family. Dear friends, if there is anyone who has not accepted Jesus Christ as their savior in this crowd today, I want you to come. Use this opportunity to surrender your, li your lives to Jesus Christ. And this is a reminder. And I have been asked that Jesus or Shine's permission to do this, but I'm sure they will be happy if somebody comes forward. And this is the time. And also, if you have not been baptized and you would like to baptize, get baptized today. Or your children to be baptized. I didn't ask his permission either, but I'm sure you'll be happy to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is the time. And do not have to wait for this. May God bless us with these words. Let us celebrate this sacrament together and be witnesses to this. Let us pray. Thank you, dear Lord, for this great privilege and time so that we bring Johan to the waters of baptism. Lord, you have given him to us as a gift, to this world as a gift. And he, his life, his baptism, Everything is a marker in our own lives. Through the sacrament of baptism, 
Johann is being initiated into Christ's holy church by water and the Spirit. All this is your gift, O God. Help us, Lord, to be faithful witnesses so that we can surround him with love and, and uh, nurture him to grow in your love. Lord, we pray that you will bless Johan, that he will be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ and a witness to your love and grace in this world. Bless his parents, his grandparents, uncles and aunts, and all of those who are gathered here today. We give all our honor and glory to you, Father, who gave us your son Jesus Christ to redeem us from our sins and the power of the Holy Spirit to fill us with your presence now and forevermore. Amen.